This week, coming soon, Wonka's Great Lakes biplane, a human-powered helicopter soars to new heights, and the USA retains the World Hot Air Balloon Championship. I'm Ashley Hale. Welcome to the Friday bi-weekly edition of Airborne here on Aero TV. Waco Classic Aircraft is making progress on the first Great Lakes biplane airframe, as well as the first airplane ordered by a customer. The company says that the project is moving into high gear with nearly all vendors online. All of the engineering updates approved and drawing updates mostly complete. Approximately 90% of all component parts for the first several aircraft are in stock, with the balance on order or in design review. The standard airplane will be powered by a 180 horsepower, like homing, four-cylinder, horizontally opposed, air-cooled piston engine, turning a hard cell aerobatic constant speed prop. Max cruise speed is projected to be 105 knots, with a service ceiling of 17,000 feet and a projected range of 260 nautical miles. One of the very best of the classic biplanes in a great aerobatic trainer, the bird will go out the door with standard equipment. The price has been set at $245,250. A team of students from the A. James Clark School of Engineering at the University of Maryland have soared to new heights in their quest for the Sikorsky Prize. With the new freshman pilot Henry Anderson providing the power, the human-powered helicopter Gamera 2 soared to an altitude of 8 feet during a recent 25-second flight. While well short of the 49.9-second world record set by the same team for duration, this new altitude mark puts them that much closer to the coveted Sikorsky Prize, which requires a controlled flight to 10 feet of altitude for a duration of 60 seconds. The $250,000 prize has gone unclaimed since its announcement in 1980, but the team in Maryland now seems to be the odds-on favorite. Who's the king of hot air? Well, it's Nick Donner of Fisherville, Kentucky. He's the new world champion hot air balloonist. Donner claimed the title last Saturday after a week of competitions in Battle Creek, Michigan. Defending World U.S. National Champion John Petron of Leewood, Kansas finished second, while Yudai Fujita of Japan was third. Donner's younger brother Chase finished fourth. Uwe Schneider of Germany rounded out the top five. Some 103 pilots representing 30 countries participated in the World Championships hosted by the Balloon Federation of America and sanctioned by the Federation Aeronautic International. The World Championships of Ballooning are held every two years, and the next will be staged in 2014 in Brazil. Donner knows the Battle Creek flying area extremely well, as he won the 2009, 2010, and 2011 U.S. National Championships held there. He's won a total of five U.S. National Championships. It's been quite a summer for the Donner family, as his younger brother Chase also won his first national championship just a month ago in Longview, Texas. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website, or our podcast, 
Send us an email to news-spy at aero-news.net. The American Helicopter Services and Aerial Firefighting Association has expressed concern about the U.S. Forest Service proposal to lift a decades-old ban on nighttime operations by helicopter operators engaged in fighting fires on federal lands going into effect in 2013. The policy change, which was announced by the USFS on August 16th, would apply only to federally protected wildland fires in Southern California. Tom Eversall, AHSAFA Executive Director, says, quote, While we understand the desire of the USFS to permit aerial firefighting operations after dark, the industry is going to approach this with caution, end quote. Todd Peterson, Vice President of Marketing for Columbia Helicopters in Portland, Oregon, reports that while the company respects the fact that catastrophic fires call for dramatic ideas regarding containment, the potential risk involved with using helicopters to fight fires at night outweigh the benefits. Others say the plan is simply not economically feasible. Specific flight corridors for helicopter flights over Long Island, New York, have some in California hoping that they can convince the FAA to impose similar restrictions in their state. Rules which took effect August 6 require helicopters to fly routes largely over water at an altitude of at least 2,500 feet off the North Shore of Long Island. The rules were the result of complaints from Long Island residents about what they often called flying limousines, ferrying people from New York to such places as the Hamptons. Lawmakers in California have been keeping an eye on the situation as it unfolds in New York. Some have been trying to convince the FAA to establish similar corridors in the Los Angeles areas, but they've met heavy opposition from the helicopter and business aviation industries. The New York corridors were established by the FAA, not Congress. Aircraft operating in public safety roles are exempt from the rules, and pilots may deviate from the corridors because of weather or during takeoffs and landings. It seems like it was just yesterday we were reporting that Boeing first flew its Dreamliner, and now the plane maker is celebrating the one-year anniversary of certification of the 787 this weekend. Tom Patton reports. Both the FAA and EASA granted type certificates for the new jetliner on August 26, 2011, and the FAA added the 787 to Boeing's production certificate. Boeing Vice President and General Manager for the 787 program Larry Loftus said, quote, Receiving those documents marked a real turning point for the 787 program and was an historic milestone for the Boeing company. Certification demonstrated that the airplane met all of the requirements for commercial operations, that we had completed the most rigorous test program in our history, and that the Dreamliner was ready to enter revenue service." End quote. The airplane's road to certification was long and not without its challenges. The program was delayed for several years while engineers worked on the issues that stem from the construction of the first composite commercial jetliner which first flew on December 15, 2009. It would be certified just over 20 months later. One month after certification, the company delivered the first 787 to launch customer ANA. One month later, the airplane entered revenue service. To date, 17 787s have been delivered to airlines, and the program has more than 800 on the order books. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. After a year of operations, flying critically injured and ill patients to and from Ashley Regional Medical Center in Vernal, Utah, a single person's complaint to the FAA has forced an air ambulance company to relocate its aircraft to Vernal Regional Airport, about two miles from the hospital. Tony Henderson, president of Classic Aviation, which operates Classic Lifeguard Air Ambulance Services in three states, said they have not been told they can't use the helipad at the hospital and that the FAA just made a strong recommendation that they not base the aircraft on the campus. Henderson has said that the crew for the helo is located across the street from the helipad. 
making it easy for them to quickly prep both the aircraft and a patient and be airborne. Moving the aircraft two miles away to the airport means the crew has to drive to the airport, prep the helicopter, and fly back to the hospital before a patient can be transported. Henderson said that it appeared that a single person living near the hospital complained often enough to the FAA that the agency finally made the recommendation to move. It's Friday and time once again for commentary from ANN's editor-in-chief, Jim Campbell. Today, Jim wants to discuss what he considers to be a proper remembrance of Neil Armstrong. Thanks, Ashley. Hi, folks. Well, piece of history passed us by this week. The first man to walk on the moon, an uncommon aviator, an uncommon man, and a very quiet piece of history slipped out of our grasp. And frankly, I'm really not pleased with the way he's been remembered so far. Networks calling him Neil Young, people putting up the wrong pictures, and then, of course, playing all kinds of games with, well, why did we go to the moon anyway? What a horrible bit of disrespect for a man who risked his life and did something that nobody, and I repeat nobody, in the entire history of man had done before he set foot on the moon. And yet at the same time, I have to tell you, I'm not quite sure that there's anything we could have done on Earth to properly memorialize what an extraordinary figure in history he was. I got to know Neil. He was a very quiet man, very humble man, funny man. The guy was the pilot's pilot and an extraordinary human being. And yet at the same time, I'm just sitting here kind of wondering, how do you properly congratulate a man's life in terms of showing the world what's possible when one man steps so far out of his boundaries as to do something that nobody had done before? And it comes to me that, frankly, it just can't be done right now. The proper memorial for Neil can't happen on Earth. It needs to happen on the moon. And I imagine sometime between now and, say, 2069, the 100th anniversary of his first step on the moon, people will gather around Tranquility Base, which hopefully by then will be preserved. There will be a pressurized habitat nearby where people can visit and pay respects and do research. But come July 20th of 2069, I hope they'll pop the cork off of something fizzy and toast the memory of an uncommon man, a guy who not only found an amazing place in history, but really set a pace that we've yet to follow. But someday, I have the greatest confidence that we will. Onward, outward, further, farther, in pursuit of knowledge. Dr. Armstrong, thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure and a privilege. Finally, today on Airborne, a year ago, the Canadian Space Agency invited Canadians to suggest their favorite regional foods as part of the Canadian Snacks for Space contest. The winning treats that will be flown to the International Space Station are to be included on Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield's menu as part of ISS Expeditions 34 and 35. Hadfield's Canadian snacks will include candied wild smoked salmon, smoked salmon pate, cranberry buffalo sticks, cereal, dried apple chunks, fruit bars, green tea cookies with orange zest, maple syrup cookies, organic chocolate, honey drops, chocolate bars, and maple syrup. Whatever happened to the good old days when all astronauts needed to go into space, or even the moon, was a glass of tang. That's our program for Friday, August 31st. Remember, Airborne is now seen twice weekly, Tuesdays and Fridays. Quick, concise, and convenient, you're always up to date when you're Airborne with Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale, thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next Tuesday with another edition of Airborne.